Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray, amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. This morning I'll be reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, and I'll be reading verses 9 through 22. And this is what it says. For they did not yet understand the Scripture, that he must rise from the dead. So the disciples went away again to their own homes, but Mary was standing outside the tomb, weeping. So as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and one at the feet, where the body of Jesus had been lying. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they put him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, and yet she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Thinking that he was the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where they put him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord and that he had said these things to her. Now, when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut where the disciples were together due to the fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be to you. And when he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his side. The disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace be to you. Just as the Father has sent me, I also send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Jesus, this day, may it be a day not just of celebration and song, but a day where your life is lived in and through us. Give us that power, that strength that comes from your Spirit. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Author Gretchen Renovic tells a story of an exchange that she had with her five-year-old son, Bjorn. She shared it on Twitter that one Sunday morning, Bjorn said, what are we doing in church today? To which his mom said, we get to worship Jesus who died for our sin. And that's when five-year-old Bjorn said, but I heard that he's fine now, he's not dead anymore. Well, there's the good news. He's fine now, he's not dead anymore. Let there be a spoiler alert for all of us because it's in this that that God changed all of history. And he changed it for you and for me. That God became flesh in Jesus Christ. That Jesus came to let us know the nature of a good and a loving God and he did it by loving. He put on flesh and he came and he loved. He came and he healed, he came, he forgave, he came and he raised the dead. People saw it with their own eyes. They told others about it. They shared with one another. But that's not when the world was changed by the coming of Jesus Christ. That 
it was not his, his healing. It was not his loving. It was not that he raised others from the dead. That it was at the height, the height of his ministry that he walked into Jerusalem and the crowds gathered around and they begin to pull off their clothes and lay them in the street. They begin to break off branches of palm trees and wave them in the air. And they begin to shout, Hosanna, which means save us. And they said, blessed is the coming of our, the king of Israel. They began to call him king. They, they saw that he was, he was ushering in a new kingdom. And, and people all around began to shout out, Hosanna. Well, the disciples were certain that, that this was when he would begin to usher in this kingdom, this kingdom, and he would, he would knock the Romans straight out of Jerusalem. Well, it was Thursday night that Jesus called his disciples to the upper room. That's when they were certain he was going to, to pass out what jobs that they had what they were going to do, who was going to be first lieutenant, second lieutenant, who was going to be the majors, and who were going to be the colonels, and, and that's not what Jesus did. Instead, he pulled out a towel and a basin to wash their feet and tell them the kind of kingdom that he was ushering in. It would be a kingdom, a kingdom where they would serve one another, and then he, he brought out another symbol, a cup and a loaf of bread. And he began to tell them that he was going to die. He was going to die on the cross and it would be in the, the, the taking in of his body, the taking in of his blood, that he would live his life through them. Well, they didn't understand this at all. They began to understand later on that night when in the Garden of Gethsemane, Judas betrayed him with a kiss and there was a strange mix of temple guards and Roman soldiers that led him away like a sheep being led to the slaughter. The next day, it was Pilate who told the, 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 those crowds that shouted for Jesus and called him Hosanna that Pilate asked them, he said, every year I let go one, would you rather me let go Barabbas or Jesus? And the same ones that shouted Hosanna now shouted crucify him. So that's what Pilate did. They led him up a hill called Golgotha, carrying his own cross. And when he got to the top of the hill, Roman soldiers pounded nails into his hands and into his feet. And he began the slow torturous death called crucifixion where he smothered under the weight of his own body little by little. The Romans, they specialized in death and when they were certain he was dead, they buried him because that's what you do with the dead. You ask any of the disciples what happened to Jesus, they would have said dead. They didn't say, well, he's only sleeping and he'll get up in three more days. No, he was dead. So they buried him. It was almost nighttime. They didn't have a, an opportunity to anoint his, his body for the burial. So on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came. It was early in the morning. The, the stone was rolled away. So she ran to tell the disciples. Well, when they came to the tomb, the, John got there first. He waited outside the tomb and, and, and Peter ran past him into the tomb. And the, the two of them went in. They saw that the grave wrappings were were over to one side and his face cloth was rolled up on the other. Scripture tells us that they saw and believed. They didn't understand. It just says that they, they saw and believed and returned home. It was Mary Magdalene who stayed there. She stayed there weeping. And when she looked into the tomb, there she saw two angels. And they asked her, woman, why are you weeping? She said, because they've taken his body and I don't know where they've laid him. That's when Jesus appears. She didn't recognize him as Jesus. She thought he was the gardener. It wasn't until he called her by name, Mary. 
And Jesus calls you and me by name this day as well. It's not just something that happened 2,000 years ago. Jesus calls us by name this day. And that's when she recognized him. That's when her eyes were opened. She said, go tell the disciples that I've risen from the dead. Now, she, she goes back and she tells the disciples and, and it's later Later that Jesus appears to them behind the closed doors and his first words to them are, peace be with you. He shows them his hands where they nailed the spikes into his hand. He he shows them his his side where he he was stabbed with a spear to make sure that he was dead. And then the Bible tells us that he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. That what he came to give was the power of God living alive in you and me, not just for disciples then, but for disciples today. He's fine now and he's not dead anymore. And that's the good news. That's the good news. He's fine now. He's not dead anymore. And that Jesus still forgives sin today. And that's the first thing that I want to talk about this morning. He's fine now. He's not dead anymore and he still forgives sin today. Maybe you heard the story about the young Notre Dame graduate that uh, after he graduated he had a choice of two jobs. He could move to Boston and get involved in, in banking or he could move to Houston and invest in, in real estate. Well, he moved to Houston and he began to work in the real estate business and that's when the bottom fell out. There in Houston, he lost everything. But he was young, he was hardworking and little by little, he began to to be whole again. And he not only earned the money that he had lost, he he earned more and decided to, to invest, to invest that money. He took all that he had, he had, had earned and he had a a choice to make. Would he invest it in computers in a a new computer company with a funny name called Apple or would he invest it in savings and loan? Well, he invested it in savings and loan and again, he lost everything. Well, now he was so dejected, he decided to go back to Indiana and he had a choice to make. There were only two airlines that flew there. One was United and the other was Eastern and he chose to fly on Eastern Airline. When he got to the airplane terminal that morning, he discovered that Eastern Airline had gone bankrupt overnight and his ticket was worthless. So what little money he had, he, he scrounged it together and he got a ticket on a two-seater plane, single engine two-seater plane and the, pli- uh, the pilot would fly him to Indiana. Well, he got about halfway there in the middle of the storm, plane engine conked out. The pilot had had two parachutes and he said, choose which one you want. So the young man chose his parachute. The pilot took the other one. The pilot jumped out. His parachute opened fine. The young man jumped out and his parachute didn't open at all. So he cried out, St. Francis, save me. And that's when a hand from the cloud came in and grabbed him by the ankle. He hovered there in the middle of the clouds. And that's when a crystal clear voice came from the cloud. Were you calling for St. Francis Xavier or St. Francis of Assisi? <laughs> well, so often we think that, that, that this life is determined by our choices. Do we make the right choices or the wrong choices? And, and, and we think those choices are held in the balance. And as long as we make more right choices than wrong choices, then, then we're, we're fine. But Jesus lets us know that our problem is not so much our choices, that it's an inside job. That the problem is that we've invested in the kingdom of self. The kingdom of self that most often makes choices out of fear rather than trusting Jesus. It's a kingdom of self that makes its choices out of shame rather than trust in Jesus that makes its choices out of self rather than Savior. 
So what Jesus did was he took all those things that would destroy us. He took the fear, he took the shame, he took the sin, he took the selfishness and he nailed it to the cross to take away its power once and for all. It's what he did on the cross for you and for me. 1 Peter 3.18 says, Christ died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, in order that he might bring us to God. That he's alive now and he has the power to bring us to God when we don't have that power at all. But Jesus didn't just die on the cross to forgive us all that's past, all this present, all the sin that would be. He died on the cross and rose from the grave. And that's what we celebrate this day. That Jesus rose from the grave and when he breathed on us his Holy Spirit, he breathed on us power, power over that old kingdom. Power enough to usher in a new creation, a new kingdom right in the here and now, right in our hearts where we live this day. The good news is that he's fine now. And not only did Jesus forgive our sins, but he rose to give us power. Power. Power in a new life today. John Smith tells a story about a young boy named Musumdiwa from Zimbabwe that Musimdwa was rescued by a church mission called Love Morehouse. And I want you to listen to the rest as Musimdwa describes his own life. He says, my life was never very good. Even my name, Musumdwa, means unwanted child. When I was two weeks old, my mother dumped me in a stack of old tires. The police picked me up and took me to my grandmother. And when she gave me back to my mother, she dumped me again, this time wrapping me in rags and leaving me in a beer hall. No one ever really wanted me except my grandmother, and she was too poor to buy enough food or pay for my school fees. After I ended up on the streets, some people at church told me about Lovemore House, and they asked me to come here. I'm going to finish school and become a soccer player. And later, maybe I will have a job in a bank. Inside my head, I ask God to help me reach my goals, to help me in school and with soccer, and especially to help me forgive others and not join in conflict. Someday, I think that God will give me another name, Amon. It will mean someone good. Jesus rose from the grave to help Musimdiwa. He rose to help him, yes, to reach his goals. He rose to help him forgive others. And yes, he rose to help him, to help him not join in conflict and to change his name, to change his heart. But not only for that boy in Africa, but for you and for me, to change our name, to change our name into someone good, to change our name into kind-hearted and generous, to change our name that means neighborly, that means Christ-like. You and I don't have the power on our own, not even trying as hard as we can. No one knows how bad they are until they try really hard to be good, is what C.S. Lewis said. And it's true. But hear the good news. Jesus rose, and he rose to give you and me that power that we might be called Christ-like. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. This morning, I don't know where you are and I don't know where you've been. What I do know is the power of the risen Christ. The power of the risen Christ not only is there to help, help us forgive others, that the power of the risen Christ is not only there to help us not enter into conflict, but the power of the risen Christ is there to 
to help us become a new creation, better than we ever could imagine. And when he breathed on his disciples then, he breathes on his disciples today that he might live his life through us. And it may be that you've never asked him to live his life through you. And you want to do that now. Well, I want to pray with you. Join with me in prayer. Jesus, this morning we come with the best news ever in history. You're not dead anymore. You're not dead anymore. And that you, you live. You live to forgive us our sins and to live your life through us. Jesus, Give us grace enough this morning to ask, to ask for your help. When we get to thinking we do things on our own, we don't ask anybody anything. We put our heads down and we seem not to notice your strength, your hand. We seem not to notice or to hear your voice. This morning, Read the power of your Holy Spirit that we might know what it is to know our sins have been forgiven. In the power of your Holy Spirit, we might know what it is to give strength, strength in the here and now, strength enough that we might live a Christ-centered life. That self-centered life, it's, it's been leading us and paths of fear, of shame, of self for long enough. Jesus, break that power and begin to live your life through us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Hi. Thank you for joining us. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Our mission here at RUMC is to help people live a Christ-centered life. We're a welcoming church, we're a biblical church, and we're a compassionate church. That the, we believe that the way that, that God made us, that he made us in his image. And what the Bible tells us is that his image is an us, is an our. When God said in the creation story, let us create humans in our image, he made us to be in community together. He made us to connect to him and one another. That's the place that this is at Roswell United Methodist Church, a place of community and faith. I want to invite you to join us. It might be online, it might be through social media, or it might be here in person. We meet at 9 o'clock in a contemporary service with a band. We also have two 1115 services. One is here in the sanctuary with a traditional choir and organ. We also meet at 1115 with a band in our chapel. Thank you for joining us, and I look forward to meeting you.